Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectators TV and broadcast on Thursday the 30th of November. I'm James Heal, the Spectators political correspondent and your host for this week's episode. Coming up on the show. Rishi Sunak has played his part in a diplomatic row over the Elgin Marbles. Not everyone in Westminster agrees with him though. I'll be joined by Katie Balls and Stephen Bush of the Financial Times. As immigration figures continue to rise here and elsewhere at an alarming rate, are governments capable of stopping them but choosing not to do so? Lionel Shriver joins me with demographer and author Jennifer D. Scuba. Cindy Yu has written about China's green agenda for the cover piece this week. As countries meet in Dubai for COP28, is Xi Jinping leading the world's green future? Cindy joins me on the show along with former head of the CBI, Tony Danker. A photo has gone viral online of a multi-faith prayer room erected outside Bristol International Airport. Reverend Marcus Walker has railed against these rooms for the magazine. He joins me on the show. And lastly, this week saw revelations about the royal family in Obed Scobie's book, Endgame. The book was mysteriously removed from Dutch bookshops the minute it was released. Alexander Lahman has the story. Before we get going, subscribe to The Spectator in our flash sale and you'll not only get your first 12 weeks in print and online for £12, but you'll also get a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label Whiskey absolutely free. To claim this offer, go to www.spectator.co.uk forward slash whiskey. It's only available within the UK, and of course, you must be 18 or over. And a big thank you to our sponsors, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer unwavering support during challenging times. To find out more, visit candowealth.com for more information. First up, Rishi Sunak faced criticism this week after cancelling his meeting with the Greek Prime Minister. Are the Elgin Marbles a sign of bigger problems to come? Joining me now is Stephen Bush from the Financial Times and, of course, the Spectator's Katie Balls. Now, Katie, I think one of the rows that's been dominating Westminster this week is perhaps about a topic we didn't expect, which is the uh, Elgin Marbles. Tell us how we got here and um, what's Number 10's thinking in all of this? Yeah, as you say, I think if we were predicting the week ahead, and actually I did predict the week ahead on Westminster Hour, um, you know, when you say, here are the big events coming up, and we did not have Elgin Marbles anywhere there. So <laughs> clearly that was messed up. Uh, Rishi Sunak was meant to meet with the Greek Prime Minister on Monday. That meeting was then cancelled hours before it took place. Uh, the reason, an interview he had given on Sunday to the Laura Koonsberg show, in which the Greek Prime Minister had been asked by the Elgin Marbles and had ultimately uh, you know, gone for it and said, you know, the current situation of having some in the UK and the rest in Athens is akin to having half the Mona Lisa and the need to be brought back together. Now, of course, this has been long been the stance when it comes to the Greek government's position on the Elgin Marbles. We've had lots of people say, well, He's just said what everyone knows. Why has Rishi Sunak cancelled this meeting? And uh, because also the Greek side quickly you know, voiced their annoyance, went quite public with their concerns. He had met Keir Starmer before, which you know could have soured the mood. Um, governing, you know, governments never particularly like it when uh, the for- foreign counterparts meet with the opposition. Mm. It turns out <laughs> lots of theories were going around as to why uh, Rishi was so annoyed. The official line is effectively there is an agreement between Number 10 and the Greek government that they would agree to the meeting requested by the Greek government, but on the condition there was not a public campaign or public comments about the Elgin Marbles because the UK position was not going to change. And I think aides were stung or at least concerned thinking back to 2021 when Boris Johnson met with the Greek Prime Minister and pre-briefing uh, you know comments ahead of it too it just meant that all the other issues were not you know didn't get much coverage it became a media circus the problem is because Rishi Sunak said I'm not going to do it and instead did an hour meeting on the NHS with officials nothing was discussed so what he really wanted to talk about boats and Gaza there was no you know, communication between the two sides. And therefore, it's quite quickly led to accusations that Rishi Sunak is very brittle. Um, yeah. He, you know, Labour is saying it shows he's not serious. Um, Labour really wanted to land this idea he's a tetchy prime minister and say, you know, he just threw his toys out the pram. The counter to this, uh, the other theory, by the way, is that this is, uh, you know, a long-term strategy to start a culture war by number 10. Though I think if you are looking for a culture war of mass appeal for their target voters, you potentially wouldn't start with the Elgin Marbles. Um, you might go for something else, given I think polling suggests only about 15% of the country really want the Elgin Marbles to stay here or feel that strongly about it. I think Rishi Sunak was annoyed because he felt as though he had been led up the garden path and an agreement was broken. Mm. And also I think that he does actually have quite strong views on the Elgin Marbles. Stephen, was this a mistake? 
Um, it wasn't, it wasn't. So in a, in a way, actually, like the government did have a positive news story um, this week, right, which was progress in ending the NHS consultant strikes. But actually, in some ways, this story has been quite convenient for both political parties because the immigration statistics are bad for the government um, because there's a chunk of their voters who are very unhappy about it, but they don't want to have to raise taxes in order to pay care workers more, not to be dependent on that, you know, that, that driver of those numbers. And the Labour Party kind of wants to be in a position where it can attack the Conservatives in the on the abstract over that number, but without themselves getting tagged or tagged with some kind of tens of thousands target that they know they're not going to meet. Mm. And in some ways, having a kind of row about is Rishi Sunak Techi and about the Elgin Marbles served both parties' purposes pretty well this week. I think, however, it, look, of course it's a mistake, and I think shows them the Prime Minister is quite callow because ultimately, like we were always going to write about the marbles, they're the they're like the, the sexy bit of the of the Anglo Greek re- relationship. But what every British Prime Minister has basically done since the return of democracy to Greece is sit down, have a you know have a polite not on your nelly, and then talk about the many many areas of agreement. And I think the problem with the public line on it is it does make it seem like Rishi Sunak doesn't understand what the job of the Prime Minister. Yeah. involves um, and that adds to the thing that what is your strategic advantage when you're the incumbent PM even when you're the incumbent PM where there's a you know global economic pressures local economic pressures pressures on the public services all of which you're on the hook for politically even though quite a lot of them aren't really his fault um, it's that you're the prime minister already and I think that by conceding any opportunity to remind people you're the prime minister to you know partly it's one of the things he does poll better on is representing the UK internationally. I think it was a minor misstep, but ultimately like the big problems facing the government are no one can get a GP and the, you know, the effective interest rates are working their way through the mortgage market. And the consequence of the trust experiment is that now people have shifted from saying, I accept and this is a global problem to basically blaming the government for all of the rise in interest rates, even though, to be honest, actually the trust effect has kind of worked its way through the mortgage market now. I think if if, if we can just stick on the marbles briefly, I think it was interesting to obviously reveal some things about Rishi Sunak, but it also we do have a policy difference now in the Elgin marbles. And that I appreciate this is not going to be the issue that decides the next election. But... Keir Starmer, I think partly for the reasons Stephen just outlined, really trying to play up the fact that he had this meeting. Because the thing Keir Starmer wants to do is show that he can be a statesman. Mm. And therefore, as many of these meetings, you see whenever you know anyone in the Labour government meets with someone from the Biden administration, it's briefed out as if it's this huge, uh, exciting moment and there's no precedent at all for opposition parties meeting it to give the sense of momentum. Mm. Similar when uh, Keir Starmer met Macron, even though Ed Miliband met Hollande um, when he was leader of the opposition. So they want to take that from it. But when it comes to, I think, why the Greek Prime Minister is warm towards Keir Starmer, it's not just that he's 20 points ahead. Keir Starmer has suggested that he supports um, the Elgin Marbles going on loan, uh, or perhaps you know a mutual loan, if the British Museum and the Greek government can agree to it. We know there's something George Osborne, in his role as head of the British Museum, wants to do, we spoke about it recently. Whereas Rishi Sunak, just I think, to probably get the context of why he actually seems to have quite strong views on this, does not think, and number 10 do not think, the Elgin Marbles should leave the UK even on a mutual loan on the concern that actually if there is a legal claim that's not relinquished, they won't get them back. So I think it does, um, you know, there is a, a light policy difference too when it comes to why the Greek government will probably prefer Keir Starmer to uh, Rishi Sunak, given the Greek Prime Minister made part of his successful re-election campaign, not the main part, but part was to renew efforts to get the Elgin Marbles back. And Stephen, in your answer there, you allude to the fact that there is this kind of continuing toy row over migration. I think some of the comments that Robert Jenrick made in the House on uh, Tuesday um, have really caught the eye. Um, what's been going on here and how much is there an extent of a difference between um, Home Office ministers um, and number 10? Well, it's odd because Robert Jenrick was originally sort of put in there essentially to be Rishi Sunak's um, eyes in the Home Office, to be Suella Braverman's minder almost. But... Uh, 
very rapidly, I think there was a feeling that, you know, he'd, he'd perhaps integrated into the community he was migrating into too well and had kind of kind of become Suella Braverman's voice eyes into Downing Street. Um, and I suspect a part of it is, and often departmental ministers, particularly when the departmental ministers aren't that good at gripping a department, tend to go native. What does going native in a home office context mean? It means going, well, I want that number to go down and fighting with the spending departments and the economic departments for, for more restrictions. And he essentially has been doing that. But also, I suspect there's an element of him feeling personally bruised that you know, he was seen as the de facto Home Secretary when that when he was first appointed. There's now another actual Home Secretary called James Cleverly. He's still not a full cabinet minister. He's actually the only one of Rishi Sunak kind of, you know, the people who kind of were, you know, bought into Rishi at mezzanine level, as it were, who's not a full cabinet minister. And I suspect he feels quite bruised about that. Katie. Yeah, I think that's true in the sense Robert Jenner has been overlooked recently for Home Secretary. Um, also, I think he's always been someone who, you know, if you are in that brief and Robert Jenrick is also seeing the fact that they're, you know, the strain in terms of places in hotels, all those things. I think if you are in the brief that he is in, you're seeing up close all the current problems with the system we have. And therefore, I don't think this is all, uh, you know, put on just to please the right of the party. But I think he is speaking more loudly about it, partly, I think, perhaps because he has not got the job he wants. But also, I think this just tends to happen, which is when a government's not doing particularly well, when I think um, you know people sense that their leader is not in the strongest position they could be, it's not all about jostling for the leadership per se, but it does mean people are more inclined and ministers are more inclined to get their side of the story out. And perhaps you're seeing collective discipline start to break down. Yeah, I mean, I think in many ways, right, the big picture story of politics at the moment, this is actually a rare example where PMQs did tell you something, not because of who won or lost the exchanges, but it really was like one of those late period Corbyn PMQs when Corbyn would stand up and there would just be this wall of kind of silence from a parliamentary Labour Party were like, yeah, we don't think it's good. We can't do anything about it. And you saw exactly that dynamic in reverse of that wall of silence behind the prime minister almost. And exactly as Katie says, when there's that sense that the leader is weak, um, everyone starts to act out a bit. Um, and once you've kind of lost that, you kind of need... I mean, the irony is, is if, you know, if if the Conservatives hold to hold Wellingborough by 10 votes, then suddenly the whole mood will transform, even though that would be pretty insane. But they kind of need something like that, I think, to change the mood around the Prime Minister. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Katie. Is immigration a problem that politicians are choosing to avoid? That's what Lionel Shriver thinks, who has written about the figures for her magazine column this week. She joins me now, along with demographer and author of The Eight Billion, Jennifer D. Scuba. Lionel, I'll start with you first. Uh, you write in this week's magazine about last week's uh, net migration figures and a certain sense of fatalism from the public towards them. Uh, explain your argument as you set out in this week's Spectator. Well, if you look at the polls in both the United States and the UK, uh, there's a lot of popular pressure for reduced immigration, that it's going, it's too much too fast, and nobody asked the people who actually live in these countries uh, whether they were interested in a mass redesign of their population. Um, and yet, there seem to be no political parties of uh, 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 big enough to matter uh, who are seriously devoted to uh, clamping down on the quantity and the rapidity of uh, incomers in both our countries. And uh, it's, it, it makes people angry, uh, but it also uh, makes them feel impotent. And I, I'm afraid that in this column, I confess to the fact that I have become uh, unhealthily addicted to reading the comments after articles about immigration in a whole range of papers. And one of the most interesting things about that sampling is that the same rage plus impotence uh, in these comments is not only where you would expect them in the telegraph, you know, or the spectator, um, but uh, and in the Wall Street Journal, of course, but even in the New York Times. And that's shocking. And New Yorkers have had a real taste of uh, immigration close up because New York is now inundated with 
uh, what New York thinks is a lot of immigrants and what the uh, border communities think is a drop in the bucket. Uh, Jennifer, I mean, you know, there's no doubt these figures that came out last week and the last two years have been, you know, extraordinary numbers for the UK to take, you know, 700,000, 600,000 or so. Uh, what do you make of Lionel's piece? And what's your attitude generally to mass migration of the kind we've seen in recent years? Yeah, you know, the thing about these liberal democracies that we live in, and liberal meaning just, you know, we're supposed to be giving people the, the right to speak up here, is that we are not going to see any big change in immigration policy because there's pressures on both the right and the left for openness, and there's pressures on both the right and the left for closure. So I think the heart of Lionel's piece saying we're stuck and we're not seeing any change. The politicians are stuck. The people are stuck. It is absolutely true, but it's baked into the system. And so that's where as a political scientist with that hat on, I see that it's been that way for decades and decades, and it will be that way in the future. A lot of what I do is talk to businesses and governments about you know, what will the future of demogra uh, demographics be like and what will the future of policy be like? And my answer for immigration is it will be exactly the same because the way these systems are designed, it doesn't allow for uh, really rational policy. And in fact, democracy itself really encourages catering to niche interests and catering to fear. And there's always a lot of fear around demographic change. Lionel, I mean, do you think that the reasons politicians aren't addressing it, how much is it to do with sort of a lack of uh, initiative, a lack of desire to, to talk about this? I mean, this morning I was watching the Home Affairs Select Committee here in Westminster, and it was extraordinary that the fact that some of the top civil servants, for instance, didn't know the figures about how many people were arriving, being detained, um, being deported, etc., after their asylum claims failed. Is it about a lack of political will, or is it simply we just don't have the technical capabilities to follow on uh, that desire to uh, try and stop the population? Rise. I, I mean, I, I submit in my column that uh, most politicians don't know how to stop immigration, even if they wanted to. In a lot of instances, they don't care enough to want to, but they're fundamentally feckless. And, uh, you know, there are, especially in the UK, uh, in Europe generally, huge legal barriers to enforcing your own borders and they just strike everyone is insurmountable and uh it's like oh i'm sorry it, it, the the helplessness that i detect in those comment threads i also detect in politicians they don't know what to do they don't know how to do it it would be hard and i'm i'm not sure i accept the fatalistic position that this is just going to keep happening and there's nothing to do. But in order to do something, it, it would take enormous political will. It would take a lot of political change. It would, in the UK, it would take a, a complete transformation of the civil service of the home office, which basically regards itself as, you know, Britain's open door. Uh, and and that's, that's, where, that's where my fatalism kicks in. I don't see that happening. I, I don't see politicians really reversing themselves and making the sacrifices and taking the political risks that would be required to at least narrow that open door. There are countries in the world who have very strict immigration policies and uh, granted they take a, a demographic hit, it means that they have older populations. I'm, you know, talk about, for example, Japan. Uh, but it's worth it to them. They have decided that they would rather uh, have a shrinking population and a coherent one uh, rather than introduce the kind of atomization and conflict that we have accepted in the rest of the West. Yes, I mean, Jennifer, I mean, Lionel Dare touches on the point about you know, social cohesion, and that seems to be uh, a real sort of the real sort of nub of the issue here, which is that people don't feel as though perhaps immigration is being something done to them in their communities. Are there any kind of policy solutions for policymakers to look at when doing this? And, and is there a possibility of the case that, as Lionel says, you know, migration is an issue certainly of increased political salience here. Is there a way of making perhaps immigration more popular, mass immigration more popular among um, in countries which are experiencing a lot of it, uh, if it's a matter of you know, better policy solutions? Or will people always be hostile to large numbers of, of, of people arriving uh, if there's a sense perhaps that they're not being catered to? 
Yeah, I think the problem that all the politicians take is that they're looking for big, splashy reforms. And those will never pass. And, and that's the case across many policy areas. We see it. I talk a lot about retirement policies. It's, you know, big things like Macron trying to raise retirement age to actually make an impact. You don't have to do the big things that will never pass. You do smaller things, but the smaller things are not sexy and you're not rewarded for that with votes. Uh, there are so many ways to ease the perception of, quote unquote, takeover by immigration, because honestly, at the end of the day, the numbers are interesting. But it's perception that matters the most. It's how you feel. And you, uh, you know, I remember 20 years ago looking at some of the, the numbers of migration into Europe that were much smaller, that, but the perception and the feeling and the rhetoric and the debate sounded exactly the same. So we, you have to start moving into nitty gritty policies. Like, do you have enough resources in local schools to help with uh, non-English speaking students who are being put into classrooms so that the community feels like their children are supported and the new incomer children are supported as well? Well, nobody wants to run on that platform. That's boring. You want to do something that really tries to you know, cater to specific uh, voting groups. So yes, there are so many policies that can be done. In the US, our asylum adjudication system is incredibly underfunded and understaffed. Well, that's a boring thing for a politician to talk about fixing, even though you would think both the left and the right would have a vested interest in fixing that system. So I think we're really stuck until we have politicians who are not putting first their own reelection and instead are thinking about how to actually make the system work for everyone. Hmm. Lionel, I was wanting to ask you, I mean, you obviously in your column to talk mostly about that kind of shared sense of fatalism, and particularly between uh, the UK and the US. But I just wondered in terms of the, the immigration debate and, and mass migration, what are the differences between the two countries in terms of, you know, obviously there's you know, the issue around you know, the UK being an island as opposed to having a large landmass with Mexico, for instance. But what do you see are the kind of similarities and contrast between the two nations and their migration approach? Well, one of the big differences is... Uh religion because uh and and that's a another spanner in the works uh, emotionally and culturally uh because the uk has a much higher immigration rate of of, of muslims uh whereas in the us basically they're coming from everywhere uh but especially from latin america increasingly from india and even from china uh the chinese are coming up through the southern border which is really surprising. Um, China's a long way away. Um, I would say they share the same fecklessness, a, a complete operational failure. Uh, and, and also they share a, a, a political relationship to immigration because, uh, you know, the so-called elite is very big on multiculturalism and um, and basically believes in open borders, it, w which is not the case with the population. So you've you've got uh, people in charge who are completely at odds with the with their with their populace, and at the same time, um, you you've got massive operational failure. Uh, in inability to deal with the numbers. Um, and I guess the biggest contrast between the two is that in the UK, the, the problem, if you look at it as, it as a problem, is legal immigration. And whereas in the US, it's mostly illegal immigration and, and to the tune of, of millions of people per year. Um, the, the Biden administration has probably let in about 8 million people. And that is, uh, even in a, in a nation of 330 million people, that's, that's starting to change the nature of your population in a tiny period of time. There's another difference, if, may, if I may, with the, the U.S. as well, just to add on to that, and that's our two-party system. Because even though you might have segments of the population that uh, are very... Um, upset about the current immigration levels or the nature of that immigration, the way the system is right now, the levels and numbers, it works for the politicians. They do not face a penalty 
for what is happening. And that's because we just have these two big groups. So when we look at polls, yes, people might, as, as Lionel mentions in her column, people might say that they want lower immigration. But when you start asking them to rank the issues that they care the most about, you start asking them about the salience of that issue for them and what really gets them to turn up to vote, immigration starts to move down the list. So that means nobody has to actually do anything. There's a, there'll be a lot of talk about it in all of the debates. It'll be all over the media, but they won't actually face an electoral penalty for doing nothing. Uh, some political scientists have called it talk tough and do nothing because you don't have to. And so that's where we start to see some really big differences between uh, the United States two-party system, and then some of the continental European systems that have multiple parties. And that's why you see some of those parties starting to gain more electoral victories on an anti-immigration platform. And that is because there are more of them to choose from. I'd say there there is also one other big difference, and that's Trump, right? The UK doesn't have a Trump. And, um, you know, the, the immigration is moving up voters list of concerns. I know in the UK, it's now number three, and that's counting everybody, including all those labor voters and green voters, it still gets to number three. Uh, and uh, I don't actually know the rankings for the US right now, but it is a huge factor in Trump's popularity. And he is the only politician who is appreciably talking about uh, mass immigration and wanting to stop it. And by the way, I say this as someone who does not support Trump, never has, and dreads another pr Trump presidency. But those pictures of the border, these tens of thousands of people moving across uh, shallow areas of the Rio Grande, being received by the border control, being put into buses and shipped all over the country with virtually no paperwork and, and theoretical appointments with immigration judges literally years from now, those pictures are politically dynamite. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Lionel. For the cover piece this week, Cindy Yu looks at how the Chinese Communist Party spotted a business opportunity in the green industry long ago. China now covers more than three quarters of the world's solar panels, while a third of electric vehicles sold in Britain are made in China. This is the start of China's green era. Cindy Yu joins me now to discuss, along with Tony Danker, former head of the CBI. Um, Cindy, you write in this week's uh, magazine about China's uh, green plans and how it ties in with their economic ambitions. Tell us more about this. Yeah, so um, China has basically spotted an economic opportunity here in the global drive for renewables. Um, the developed world has been getting more and more climate guilt over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and China, you know, it is the world's largest polluter, but it's also the factory of the world as well. So what happened was as soon as, um, as early as 2005, really, China's been looking into renewables as an export opportunity. It's really wanting to move on from the three things that underpinned its economy before, which clothing, home electronics and furniture and going into much more high tech green tech stuff. And this is great. You know, this is a great business opportunity because the world is only demanding more of these things, not less. Mm. Um, and what's amazing is, you know, as ever is the case with China, when they set their mind to doing something, the industry just moves so incredibly fast uh, that we're now looking at basically real domination of various renewables industries from EVs to lithium batteries to solar power to wind power, all of these things. At the same time, the West is not supporting its own businesses in competing with China on these as much as the Chinese government is. So you see this kind of imbalance going on. Mm. Tony, has the West been left behind on this? And specifically, how is Britain faring at a time when, for instance, you know, the American government to have the Inflation Reduction Act, for instance, is there a danger that Britain is particularly left behind in the race for renewables? Yes, absolutely. And uh, Cindy described it absolutely correctly. You know, by my numbers, I think Chinese green stimulus is double the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, is four times the EU stimulus, and I know that in British politics, we're criticizing the Labour Party for wanting to spend £28 billion on green stimulus. That would be a 40th of China. So we are left as a country uh, really once quite ahead on a lot of areas of green technology, of green industry, suddenly finding ourselves completely outgunned by the rest of the world. And do you think perhaps there's a chance then that the net zero 
agenda can become an issue of national security and all this. And actually that we sh we've seen some powers in terms of uh, the National Security Act and the Industry Act. Do you think that should be extended in terms of these spheres and government should play much more of a role in order to try and catch up with what the Chinese are ahead and not of us on? Oh, I worry about that. I worry about that. I want to go straight to the wedge issue for spectator audience, right? Which is a, a scepticism, a hawkishness towards China. But at the end of the day, this is about markets, mm. right? And in a way, EVs are just the latest of yet another manufactured good at which China can dominate the world for all kinds of reasons. And as you say, you know, the argument against the Chinese uh, sort of dominating the EV market is either one of, well, their subsidies are too high. But to be honest, this is a sector that everybody's subsidizing. Even us in the UK are subsidizing this market. Or we're going to claim it's a national security issue. And I think we just need to be careful about that one, right? You will know much more than me about the China issue and how the UK needs to confront China in the new world. I think it's a stretch to say that them owning our EVs is a big national security threat. There are clearly some strategic industries we need to be careful about. I just don't think the cars on our street are one of them. Mm. Uh, Cindy, um, Tony there talks about you know, markets. And I wondered how much is this about kind of, you know, Beijing top-down order state control mm. since 2005? Or has this just been something that's organic and responding to kind of changes, you know, in the West rather than any kind of central diktat? You know what it was? It was China, in a way that it does, throwing a lot of money at things and just seeing what sticks, mm. right? So in 2015, it has this industrial policy called uh, Made in China 2025, which is basically giving itself a 10-year window in which to really excel at the high-tech industries of the future, semiconductors, robotics, aerospace, renewables as well. And it's just chucked lots of money at all of these sectors. And renewables has been the biggest success story from this. Not so much semiconductors and not so much robotics, all of these other things. Um, and so that this is, we're looking back now and thinking, oh my God, how do they do that? But actually they, they bet on a lot of horses. Um, and when it comes to, you know, the net zero agenda, you know, I think there will be an interpretation of this story, which is that, oh, China's been egging us on to go to net zero just so that we would buy their goods. It's not so much that. It's that it's been clear for quite a long time that this is what the world, where the world needed to go in tackling climate change. It's been clear. It's been clear to the West as well. I mean, we've been driving <laughs> this kind of climate targets. What we haven't been doing is driving the industry that would be providing these goods. So you, the UK is this world's second largest installer of offshore wind, but we don't have a wind manufacturing industry in this country to speak of. So why don't we? <laughs> so it's that kind of incongruity that China doesn't really have because it's just, you know, thinking about all of these things as business opportunities very strategically. And then to Tony's point about the security concerns, I mean, I think let's see how much just in 10, 15 years they really dominate the EV market, right? I mean, the, it is technically possible for an electric vehicle to be switched off by a manufacturer remotely, right? So let's say two thirds of British cars on EVs on the roads are Chinese in 20 years. If they all en masse sh shut down, clearly that's a security risk. But there are so many other ifs involved in that. Could the Chinese company, will it, will it really do that, considering that would be pretty much suicide for that company to be kind of killing its customers? Uh, will the Chinese Communist Party really demand that of a company? Um, all of these different things, I think there are a lot of ifs here, but when we talk about national security in this kind of fevered era that we're in at the moment, it's a lot of it is about what is the potential for something to go wrong? What is the potential for something to happen? And, you know, it's technically possible, but will it really happen? And that's the, that's the analysis that, you know, policymakers have to make. Tony? Well, look, I think what this whole thing poses a real question about is, can the UK compete mm. in a green industrial revolution that is mostly made affordable by big countries in the world through subsidy. And we have a government right now that doesn't want to participate in subsidy. Although, by the way, we'll throw in a little bit for Nissan the other week and a little bit for you know BMW uh, and Mini uh, a few months ago. So I think the government's a little bit confused about what their stance really is. But this is a government that doesn't want to compete with the Inflation Reduction Act in the US or with the Chinese or the European stimulus. And I understand why, I understand the principles behind why, but let's be clear, it means you lose, mm. right? And then we have a Labour Party who want to invest at uh, you know, uh, what we regard as a pretty big amount, but even that isn't going to be sufficient. And so I think Britain needs a more thoughtful and a smarter net zero strategy than we've had so far. Mm -hmm. You know, we've gone from Boris Johnson's 10 point plan, which I kind of loved. Actually, Boris doesn't get enough credit for being an absolute green believer, mm -hmm. but it was a, you know, it was an unprioritized strategy. We're gonna have more of everything, every form of, you know, low carbon energy. We're gonna have all these kind of product markets like EV to a Rishi Sunak strategy, which seems to be retreat. 
And of course, the truth has to be somewhere in between. Britain is going to have to work out what are our bets in the green economy. We don't have a lot of stimulus, mm. right? We don't have a lot of. Uh, we do actually have quite a few advantages and things, as you said, like wind, and we do have some in EVs. So let's have a strategy that places some bets rather than being subscale in everything in a world where scale matters. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for my piece, I spoke to um, Adam Berman, who is at Energy UK, one of the industry groups um, involved in talking to these energy companies in the UK. And his idea was basically talking about these nascent industries like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, which stuff that China hasn't really, and nobody in the world has really kind of cracked because the technology hasn't really existed just yet. So why don't we use the British R&D specialities here? And we should be, that would be a cheaper, more focused way of doing these things rather than the American or the Chinese way, which has a lot of wastage involved when it comes to the money involved. So I think we could still rest back the lead. It's just that Rishi Sunak's not talking about it. All he's talking about is watering down the net zero target or turning, pushing back the petrol car ban without really talking about what he can be doing for the EV com companies in this country. So there, there is still inconsistency from the British approach, but maybe Keir Starmer will change that shortly. Well, well I think whoever's in power, right? We are subscale in what is a continental sized economics, right? That's what green markets have become, continental sized. So I think on all of these choices, which forms of energy, offshore wind, onshore wind, solar, hydrogen, which color hydrogen, I think Britain needs to take a very simple choice. Are we going to be distinctive in this? Are we going to genuinely lead the world? Are we going to be competitive in this? In other words, we need to kind of keep up, but we're not going to kid ourselves, we'll be world beating. Or do you know what? Is it okay to buy them in? Is it okay to import them? Is it okay that China makes our electric vehicles? Is it okay that China makes the blades in our wind turbines? Maybe the answer is yes. I don't know what the right answer is, but no government's going to have enough money in the UK to make all these bets. We're going to have to choose. I mean, what have been the things stopping us from making those choices? I mean, obviously, the question of money and obviously money's tight right now. It's the refrain I hear most in Westminster and Whitehall is, you know, there is no money left. So, OK, it's not just about, about resources. Um, I don't particularly think it's going to be a sort of an, an election issue in terms of the kind of, you know, green issues about investment, etc. What is it in terms of policy issues that mean stopping us from coming down on the right the side, whether it be right or wrong, etc., or coming down on one side for total? What are the kind of things that you've seen in terms of uh, policy in inhibitions in the last few years and decade or so? Look, I think it's just an inability to choose. Mm. And maybe, I'm sorry to get a bit existential here, maybe that's about us coming to terms with the size that we are and our ability to compete in a world that's increasingly continental, right? Maybe we'll look back at this and saying, it's a natural choice that a country like us needs to make post-Brexit. Right? Mm. We're not in a big scale market that therefore has probably got the scale to play at everything. Uh, we're going to have to choose our bets. We're going to have to be pluckier, bolder, braver. And I think when you look at the UK, I mean, there are some areas where we have natural advantage. You've spoken about some of them, right? Wind is the obvious one, right? Poor Boris used to get mocked for saying we should be the Saudi Arabia of wind. But of course, he was right, right? Wind is an obvious area where the UK should dominate. There are definitely parts of the EV value chain where we can dominate and lead the world, particularly in R&D. Yeah. The idea that we're going to compete on assembly, cheap assembly of electric vehicle uh, cars, right, is a hard one, but we probably do have to be competitive in it. We do have to have some kind of presence. And in the end, like every market, right, uh, something being cheap is one reason to buy it. But something being better quality, better brand, better design, better style. I mean, that's the way the car markets always worked. Um, James, so one of the companies that I looked at uh, that has failed in, in recent months is British Volt, a British startup which looked at um, battery making. And it was going to be one of the two gigafactories of making batteries in the UK. They went bust in January and the former CEO has since then come out and blamed, you know, to your, to your question, blamed government instability. You know, during the time over the last over the last year when they were struggling financially, they had three different prime ministers. They have numerous different secretaries of state dealing with them on, in different ways. Um, he directly pointed the finger of blame at the Treasury as well for not releasing funding because of the political instability. So I think part of it is just that we've had so many leaders, you know, talk about Boris Johnson's 10 point plan. That was only two years ago. Mm -hmm. right? And now we've got a leader who's totally watering down net zero. So I think that is also a part of it. And maybe after the next election, things will stabilise a bit more. But the British political turmoil can't be ruled out, I think. 
Uh, we've focused mostly in this discussion on Britain, um, Cindy, but how's it all gone down in China? And recently you, you wrote in the piece about uh, President Xi visiting America and trying to signal to the West that you know, China's still open for business. Um, one element of this is the economics, but there's also the domestic policy seeks to consider and a more prosperous middle class wanting to ensure you have higher environmental standards. Just talk us through that. Yeah, exactly. So we often obviously see stories through a British lens, understandably, but actually for China, this kind of export opportunity is also about making sure that the country becomes cleaner domestically as well. And this might sound crazy to people watching at home because Beijing is so polluted. You know, we know all about the country's opening of new coal plants. All of these things are happening and it's true. But actually, because of the growing middle classes in China, they're demanding not necessarily political rights so far, but the right for their children to breathe safe air, to drink safe water. And the government um, in the last nine years have said that they've announced the war on pollution, basically. And the figures show that um, international observers have shown that um, Beijing air pollution has been halved in the last 10 years, uh, that there are hundreds of millions more people with access to safe drinking water because the rivers have been cleaned up. So what we've seen in China is a huge industrial revolution, uh, a huge scale of industrial revolution and really fast pace uh, over the reform era. But now as people get richer and as the economy slows down, they're demanding more things like just environmental conservation, just being able to have access to safe air and water. And the government is trying to give that to them because otherwise it becomes a legitimacy problem for the CCP as well. You know, air pollution was one of the most controversial issues for a lot of Chinese middle class people, not so much voting rights, but that. So so for the Chinese Communist Party, they had to do something about it. And, and that's why we see their domestic market for renewables is also huge. You know, Chinese people are buying EVs en masse as well. So I think that's fascinating to think about this kind of coal uh, guzzling country also becoming the green, uh, the engine of the green revolution globally. You know, a lot of people will say, uh, this is hypocrisy on the part of the Chinese to be sort of pushing EVs our way and dominating markets while simultaneously investing in coal. I mean, I think every economy in the world is guilty of such hypocrisy right now, right? And it's not really hypocrisy, it's trying to manage this transition. One of the interesting UK political points that hits this discussion is Rishi Sunak choosing to ban, uh, sorry, to push back the ban uh, on, uh, on traditional cars uh, and sort of postpone that idea of everybody switching to EVs. You know, that was done for electoral purposes, but it has had a knock-on consequence on the economic viability of the EV market, right? The truth was Britain was a highly competitive destination for electric vehicle manufacturing, assembly, R&D, battery production, because we had basically said by 2030, this market is go. And once you put that back for political reasons, and if, if we have an election where actually we're going to have parties trying to use green deadlines, green targets as a political football because they think the voters like it, that will have an economic consequence, right? Pushing back by five years, right, the deadline for everybody switching to EVs pushes back the development of the market, makes Britain a little less competitive. So there is a risk in an election year. If we want to try and row back, if the Conservatives want to row back from green pledges in order to win votes, there is an economic knock-on effect in a market where we're already struggling to compete. So that's my little pitch for keeping up green targets, not because I'm trying to be some green campaigner, but because that's the way, one of the ways in which we can compete economically with people who are much bigger than us. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Tony. You may have seen an image go viral this week of a strange pod built outside Bristol International Airport. That's a multi-faith prayer room, which has since been ridiculed by many online. Reverend Marcus Walker is with me now to discuss. Hello, Marcus. I think you've written probably my favourite feature in this week's magazine uh, about uh, multi-faith prayer rooms. And it's amazing how something so ugly could inspire something so beautiful in your feature this week. Um, you've written specifically about this new infamous viral uh, multi-faith prayer room that's just been erected outside uh, Bristol International Airport. Could you just tell us a bit about this and what inspired you to write this week's feature? Well, Bristol Airport decided to unleash this uh, multi-faith area through the medium of Twitter earlier this week. And it, well, I mean, I think it's safe to say that it immediately became the, uh, a viral tweet. It was you know, th th their enthusiasm for announcing that this multi-faith 
prayer area had been opened on the side of the Silverfield roundabout in the free waiting zone of the airport was not matched by the photographs, which, well, just looked so insultingly pathetic. It was, I mean, at first I actually thought it was a prank. Um, it's essentially a bus stop, um, a particularly ugly bus stop, um, made of sort of plastic and perspex glass. It's um, It's got walls that don't quite get down to the floor, probably to make sure the homeless can't sleep in there, because we all know that if there's one thing the people of faith really don't like, it's the homeless or the poor being among them. Um, it's, I mean, it almost perfectly sums up the the contempt with which so many people in officialdom actually hold um, religion in. Yeah, I mean, I think more seriously, you do write in your piece this week about the dangers of trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator and affect trying to please everyone, you please no one. Is this something that we're seeing more of, not just in you know the Church of England, but also I think probably all walks of life as well? Absolutely. Um, and actually, it's insulting to people of all faith. I mean, broadly speaking, this is the kind of prayer room only a person of no faith could create. All faiths, Hindu. Um, Muslims, Buddhists, Christians of every different shape and size have found ways to ensure that their spaces of prayer are ones which enhance the soul and enhance the mind and draw the mind towards the divine. Um, the greatest art in the history of mankind has been uh, created in order to exalt uh, God and draw the human mind to God. So the idea that, well, you know, just stick them in an empty room, ideally a bus shelter on the side of a roundabout, and they'll just be happy, is something only somebody of no faith could conceivably have. And it insults, you know, it insults Muslims, it insults Jews, it insults Hindus, it insults Buddhists, it insults Christians, it insults everybody, really. Um, and the general defence is, you know, oh, well, of course, you can worship God anywhere. You know, you don't need anything in particular. Um, and, well, I mean, I, you know, to an extent that's true. But in the end, there is a reason, there is a psychological reason why beauty enhances worship and enhances prayer. And there's a psychological reason why every faith has always tried um, to use beauty to this effect. Yes, and I think you write in the piece as well about uh, prayer and, of course, you know, some of the most devout prayer comes in some of the most difficult of circumstances. We can all think of famous examples in culture and history and in contemporary today Christianity, just to give a few examples. But as you say, just because, you know, in necessity you can pray somewhere doesn't mean it should be in the most barren, uninspiring, and frankly, as you put it, you know, the piece sort of ir irreligious environments, just like this 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 uh, glorified um, you know, prayer room. Um, I just wondered, as a result of what you know you've seen on Twitter, etc., do you think there is a bit of a backlash, and do you think that some of this kind of you know, soulless style uh, public places uh, there, there could be a reaction to that? Well, I hope so. I mean, I hope that in public places we might actually start to think a lot more deeply about what people need, particularly in places like airports, where an awful lot of people are frightened. Um, if disaster strikes as, you know, tragically from time to time it does all around the world. It's a place where people are going to turn um, in their deepest distress or fear actually to start asking what's needed. And the reality is different faiths probably need different spaces with different things. We actually need to recognise that different people will find different ways of being enhanced to the divine, although actually just any form of beauty can be used as a great as a great tool, and we might just be able to identify what ways might enhance um, people's soul um, and, 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 and actually start, start properly putting our thinking caps on rather than just making a desultory, tokenistic gesture like this. I mean, how long have these multi-faith prayer rooms been, been put up for? I mean, it seems to be a relatively recent phenomenon. How, how does this one compare to any others you have seen or visited, uh, Mark? I suspect you're not a regular to many of these multi-faith prayer rooms, but um, just wondered if you give us a bit of context to the one that's just been erected at Bristol. No, I suppose I'm not. A, well, I mean, it depends. 
really what you mean though that, that you when you visit when i visit people in hospital very much depends which hospital you're going to as to what the the, the provision um is like um thinking about the hospital right next door actually one of the places of prayer is actually a a church. It's a church run by us, St. Bartholomew the Less. I'm in St. Bar- well, the parish is Great St. Bartholomew. We have a big church, the Great, and a little church, the Less, and the Less is inside the hospital. And it's Christian, it's Anglican, and it's filled with the imageries that we find helpful. And it is never empty, never at any moment of the day is it empty. There are always people in there lighting candles, praying, kneeling, giving thanks, crying, crying in fear, crying in sadness, crying in joy. Um, but you can see that it's the, it, the the visual signs are hugely important. There are also other prayer spaces for other people of other faiths around the hospital, and that works very well too. But you know, whenever I've been to an airport uh, multi faith prayer space or to a hospital multi faith prayer space, I mean, if I'm honest, in a hospital, I'd rather pray by somebody's bed where there's real necessity than in just a a, a, a blank space. Um, in an airport, you know, I'd rather whip out my prayer book and pray, you know, just sitting on a bench than just be in this sort of sterile, arid environment. I almost think it's a hindrance to prayer. You know, and I think it's awfully sad. Yes, I mean, you describe in the piece about it being you know, almost tokenistic. You know, we need a multi-faith prayer room box ticked. So actually, I think, you know, what you're saying there is just, it's not even any kind of... You know, even not even a faith or lack of faith, etc. Just purely as a matter of sort of formality and bureaucracy, rather than any kind of proper thinking or feeling. And also, I mean, I would say it, it almost. I have to say, when when just trying to get into the space for prayer, um, I could pray much better in, say, the Blue Mosque in uh, in Istanbul, um, and have prayed with those wonderful windows in the um, Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. And hope one day with the world calms to be able to go to the Umayyad Mosque in, in Damascus. So places of great beauty where I can personally connect with the divine, where I can feel that souls have been uplifted. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying every single chapel needs to be a Christian and ideally an Anglican sort of one. Actually, it's about recognizing that beauty is important. And beauty is important for people of of religions across the world well quite and as you say you know the beauty of all different faiths has inspired so many who are not of those faiths as well um um marcus thank you so much for joining us on spec tv really appreciate you giving us your time thank you and finally what royal revelations appeared in obed scobie's end game that led to the book being quickly removed from the shops on the day of its release alexander larman joins me now with the story Alexander, thanks for joining Spectator TV. Uh, the Royal's been back in the news this week with the release of Royal Correspondent Omid Scobie's new book. Uh, it quickly had to be removed from the bookshelves in the Netherlands. Uh, tell us what happened there. Well, the trouble is, James, is that as luck would have it, there was this translation of Omid Scobie, and I think calling him a Royal Correspondent is putting it a bit strongly. His new uh, book, Endgame, came out. And... What's very interesting is that in the English version, Omid, as we must call him, reveals that there are two members of the royal family who were the racist royals, who apparently, when the when Meghan was pregnant with her first child by Prince Harry, asked what skin colour the baby was likely to be. Now, Omid claims that he knows who these people are, but he can't possibly say who they are because of UK laws. But obviously, in Holland, you don't have UK laws. So as luck would have it, this translation that has appeared has the names of the two people involved. So what's happened is that the the Dutch publisher has pulled these titles off the shelves and said, oh, no, we couldn't possibly have meant to say that. But of course, all the proof copies have already gone out to all the editors and reviewers and bloggers. So every single person in a position of public influence in Holland who'd be sent a copy of the book will now know the identities of these two people. And it's, it's hilarious because Scobie gave an interview to Dutch television in which he said, well, my version of the book doesn't have any of this information in it. And you're thinking, 
what do you mean, your version of a book? I mean, are there about 10 different versions that exist whereby your version is just one of them? And it's it's hilarious, really, because you can imagine this, this idea that, you know, Camp Sussex has a dozen people out there just like Scopey, and that he's this sort of, he's not so much one person, there's about 10 of them. So, I mean, all <laughs> lightheartedness aside, what you have to see is that there is clearly something happening from Camp Sussex, and that... I mean, Meghan especially has been quite quiet this year because Harry had spare, he's had all the publicity around that, and he's had Invictus. But, I mean, all we've really heard about her is this stuff about will she be making a cameo in the last season of Suits and stuff like that. And I think one thing we've seen over the last half decade is that Meghan Markle is not a woman who doesn't like publicity. So what you start to think to yourself is, is she going to be doing something via intermediaries which is going to get her side of the story back out there. And obviously the biggest detail from the Oprah Winfrey interview that she and Harry did in 2021 was to hint about the idea of this racist member of the royal family. And the fact that Scobie has put this detail into the book with this added bonus name means that <laughs> we all have to wonder, well, how exactly has some translator in Holland decided, hmm, I know, I'm going to create the biggest royal news story of the year for fun. And it, I mean, none of it's adding up. And a lot of what's going on means that they're treating you, me, and the average person on the street like idiots. And I think what we have to be asking is, there is an agenda, and whose agenda is it? And what exactly is going on? Well, talk about, you know, speaking your truth, uh, giving one-sided accounts. Um, what are the other main claims in this new book? Obviously, the racist world one is the one that's dominated the headlines, but I just wondered from what we've heard and seen so far, are we expecting more of those kind of revelations or is it a sort of a one headline fact story? Well, what, what, what was interesting for me is when I saw the first stories of the book, I thought, there's nothing new here. I mean, oh, Prince William wants to be king. Oh, Princess Kate is quite amenable and she's quite tame compared to Meghan and Diana. Oh, you know, there are tensions between William and Harry. And I, I just kept thinking, everybody knows all this stuff. I mean, literally nothing that I saw the first weekend's revelations was of the slightest surprise to me. And I think that what Scobie and his publishers may have done is a kind of dead cat strategy because Finding Freedom, which is a rubbish book, which Scobie wrote a few years ago about... Harry and Meghan escaping from the cruel confines of the royal family. It was a massive bestseller because what we're not used to in this country is the idea that we, we write books about the royal family which are not hagiographies, which is just straightforward, muckraking gossip. And I think that the fact that the book was very critical of the royal family and also very, very flattering about Harry and Meghan meant that there was a market to that. And so the publishers have decided that um, Endgame, which... I thought it would have nothing to do with the Beckett play, but Scobie quotes the Beckett play at the end. So you see, he's an intellectual as well as everything else, which is really, really flattering. I think that the trouble that we now have is that, I mean, what what's going to come that's, that's new? And you see, ah, if you name the racist members of the royal family, the Dutch translation of the book, so that it helpfully goes viral, the week of publication, so that when it eventually comes out, it gives you all the credit and all the story that you couldn't have put in the UK. I mean, it's, it's, it's clever. It's cynical and it's Machiavellian, but it's clever. And I just don't know who it's coming from. It's coming from his publicists, in which case, you know, give him all the rays. It's coming from Scobie, in which case, give him a knighthood. Or, as is more likely, is it coming from this couple who have, you know, a huge amount of power? I mean, they've, they've got deals with these... I mean, okay, <laughs> the deals are slowly dwindling away because nobody watched the Netflix series, nobody listened to the Apple podcasts or Spotify podcasts. But nonetheless, you're talking about a huge amount of influence. And so no, I cannot believe that any of this is coincidental or accidental. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned there in your, your sort of answer there the nature of diminishing returns. And frankly, how much is there a public appetite? A few years ago, of course, there was finding freedom. But having heard so much from... Harry and Meghan and the wider camp Sussex etc about what went on during the years they were active royals I mean is there now a sense perhaps that interest has waned in all of this hence why perhaps we're seeing now 
Meghan and Harry keeping a, a slightly more dignified silence in the hope that they could be remitted to the fold? I think uh, dignified silence is putting it a bit strongly. I think it's more uh, you send in your attack dog and you're standing on the side and you're placing bets on what your attack dog is going to do. But no, I think that the question that I have is that, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was all this story brief, brief to press in great detail about the reconciliation between Harry and King Charles. And then also at the same breath, the idea that William and Harry, there is no reconciliation and the two are forever estranged. And what I want to know, I mean, I'm become fascinated by all this. I mean, I, I, I'm literally the equivalent of your popcorn munching punter is what is going to, I mean, quite literally, what is the end game here? Because I think Harry has done more damage to the royal family than anybody since Edward VIII. He's probably done more damage than Edward VIII as well, because he's with Edward VIII when he became Duke of Windsor, he just packed him off to the Bahamas and made him irrelevant. Whereas Harry in California, he's still this figure of international fascination. And, I mean, while I don't think he's particularly clever, Meghan is clever, and you can see that between the two of them, you are working towards this solution, which I think is nothing less than the demolition of the royal family as it stands. And in Scobie, they found a very useful Boswell of their collective Johnsons, who is very happy to give them what they want. And I think it's both sinister and also fascinating, because ultimately... Republicans everywhere are going to be rejoicing at Endgame because they're going to see this book as the absolute vindication of what they've been saying for years. But for the rest of us, you just think to yourself, well, are the royal family really that awful? Are they really the uh, David Icke <laughs> in incarnation of them as you know cheese-eating lizards or whatever Icke says these days? Or are they, in fact, flawed human beings who are placed on the international stage and be given far more scrutiny than any of us would ever like? And thus, their flaws are magnified far beyond what they actually are. Alexander, thank you so much for joining us on Spectator TV today. That's it for this week. Once again, if you do enjoy Spectator TV, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss another episode. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer unwavering support during challenging times. Visit candowealth.com for more information. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week.